morning, we have a couple of international speakers today, which is kind of awesome. Um, Bertie, uh, Val Bertie is from VMware, they, uh, and Hans Bernhardt, which I think we all know, they're from the live fire team at VMware, which means they travel around the world and they teach NSX to people. Um, so with that, I'm going to give this over to Hans because I know he has too much to say in too little time. Thank you, Chris. All right, thank you, everybody. Um, welcome to the VTUG, uh, 9 a.m. We're going to wake you up and get you to greeties this afternoon. Um, my name is Hans Bernhardt. Um, I am known as, if you look in the slide there, Chicken Man at VMware. So how many of you have been to previous VTUGs? <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> so you guys know. All right, so I, didn't, I need not say anything more. Uh, this is Bell Birdie. That's his real name. And we've been having fun with the whole notion of uh, Chicken Man and Birdie. So I'm your sidekick. Basically. Bingo, yeah. bingo. Um, so uh, just a, a couple quick things uh, before I kick into things. Uh, read the NDA disclaimer, done, standard. You guys got that? Okay. Um, no roadmap information is to be discussed with customers or posted to any social media sites or public forums. Uh, we need to put that up there just from a logistics standpoint so that you all are aware. Um, now, who are we? Uh, Again, I've been with VMware for 18 years. My role has been varied. Um, I'm now, uh, well, we'll say for this presentation, I'm an MC um, to, to uh, bring Bal up here, who's a VCDX in networking and uh, very good at what he does. I have fun translating things into something to help people's light bulb go off and understanding our technology and then hand over to somebody who's going to give you some of the, the deep uh, 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 nuances of that technology, we'll put it that way. We're both on a team called the Live Fire Solutions and Services team that travels globally and we teach how our products work together as solutions. We can talk more about that later at Gritty's. Um, I'll leave it at that. Um, as Chris said, international, Bal flew from UK. Uh, he got stuck in New York yesterday, uh, 28 hours of travel. So we've given him a lot of coffee for this morning. Mm -hmm. So give him your energy, please. Um, I'm already hyper enough. I don't need coffee, but I've already had two cups. What we're going to do for you today, um, we're going to do a really brief NSX review. I mean, anybody here new to NSX? You new? Okay. We're going to do a real brief NSX overview. That's what I'm going to do. And then I'm going to hand it over to Bal, who's going to talk about uh, containers, in particular VMware integrated containers, and then the NSX integration with containers. So this is some pretty cool, uh, relatively new cutting edge integration here, um, where you're using this new thing called containers, which I'll let him describe that to you. And then you're going to integrate that with uh, NSX networking in, into your solution. So with that said, uh, let's kick into the NSX overview. And this is just going to be really brief. I mean, I could talk for days about this. We need, for those of you who are new, to get you to understand what is this virtual networking thing. Now, in the old days, virtual networking with ESX server was simply saying, here's a virtual switch in a hypervisor, a standard virtual switch. And then we said, well, rather than have a standard virtual switch in a single hypervisor on ESX server, we can actually distribute that switch across multiple hypervisors in a cluster, in a, in a virtual center data center. The whole idea there was simply saying, rather than have a dedicated piece of hardware that is a switch, a physical switch, um, with ports on it and wires in it and blinky lights, and we'd look at that and we'd say, well, what is it actually doing? Well, all it's doing is keeping uh, track of uh, ports and MAC addresses of, of network cards. Rather than have you know, dedicated physical hardware, why don't we move that table of MAC addresses and um, ports into the hypervisor? Why don't we make that a module in a hypervisor where the hypervisor is creating a virtual switch and it's just a table of MAC addresses and, and virtual NIC cards. And then why don't we distribute that across multiple hypervisors? That's what we did with vSphere, where we said standard virtual switch in the old days, now let's distribute that and make it appear as one big switch across multiple ESX servers. And then virtual center will act as kind of a control point of that. Well, then entered NSX. NSX, a couple years ago when we bought NYSERA, NSX said, we want to create this thing called the, the, the virtual network overlay, 
We want to go beyond just standard virtual switches, distributed virtual switches in a single data center. We want to have this NSX overlay where you can have a layer two switch span across an entire physical data center and beyond. What does that mean? What is this network overlay thing? Well, you think in terms of networking, and you think, how many of you remember the ISO model of networking, the seven layer model of networking? Well, each one of those layers has a function associated with that, and each one of those layers has a protocol associated with that. And you know that to do networking, you go down the layers and then back up the layers between two devices. Well, layer two is quite simply that MAC address port table layer, okay? And if I can take my network traffic at layer two and tag it, everybody familiar with VLANs? Okay, I can tag that traffic in a physical sense. We think of VLANs as just being part of our network now. We understand that concept where I would tag one to 4,095. I can give you one of 4,000 VLANs by tagging that network traffic with a number. And that says this is a dedicated network based on the tag of that network traffic. I take it a step further with NSX and I use VXLAN as my tagging mechanism. VXLAN says I have 16 million choices of networks, virtual networks, simply by tagging my traffic. And now I can create this network by making a module in the hypervisors called a virtual tunneling endpoint do that work for me. So the virtual machine says I want to talk in a layer two network. It sees the layer two network. The virtual machine's traffic goes down into the hypervisor. The hypervisor says I will tag the traffic with VXLAN 5005. Then that ESX server will talk to all the other ESX servers, and if there's a virtual machine over here that is also on the 5005 network, VXLAN, that traffic will go to the other ESX server, the virtual tunneling endpoint there will untag it and send the virtual machine its traffic based on VXLAN 5005. The virtual machines see a layer two network between them, Underneath them, through the hypervisors, is that network overlay doing that tagging with the VXLANs. That's basically what's going on here. That first network overlay of NSX is what everything else uh, is going to go on top of. So if you watch my slide here, you say, well, two virtual machines can talk to each other because they're on the same layer two network. They're both on VXLAN 7000 because the ESX servers are tagging that traffic appropriately. That virtual machine does not see the other virtual machines because it's on a different VXLAN. It's on a different layer two network. Well, this is where we start getting into the layers of services. You think that ISO stack, we go to layer three, which is TCP IP, or it's IP, internet protocol. Now we can stick a module on the hypervisor for routing at layer three. Rather than having a router out, a physical router dedicated out in the edge of your network, we can now do this thing called distributed routing. We just give all the hypervisors the brains of a router, and now that router is inside the hypervisors and all of our layer three routing doesn't even have to leave the virtualization environment at this point. And then we say, now you all have IP addresses, and now the virtual machine on the other layer two network can see the virtual machines on um, the first network because we have IP, internet protocol, and we have a router between them. But you also notice that the virtual machine can only see the first virtual machine on ports 80 and 443. Why is that? Because we can stick another module in our hypervisors called the distributed firewall and distribute that functionality across all the ESX servers. We have not left the ne networking, I'm sorry, we have not even gone down to the physical network at this point. We've, we're staying purely in the east-west virtualization environment at this point. And a distributed firewall simply says, look, I can capture traffic as soon as it leaves the virtual machine in the hypervisor and make a decision about whether to allow that traffic or not. And I can do the exact same firewall rules that you would do in a traditional environment where you have a firewall on the edge of your physical network. So once you get the concept of the NSX overlay, tagging VXLAN traffic to give you the distributed layer two network, the idea now is you can add additional functionality in terms of layers. You stick a virtual machine in there called a load balancer. It's called an edge services gateway. Um, you can have additional networking services, NAT, VPN, and more. And the nice thing about with NSX is it's all programmatic. 
So it's cloud consumable, meaning I could have a cloud management system looking at my vSphere environment and simply say, build those virtual machines, um, build those VXLANs, give me that layer two networking. Oh, we want a distributed router. Oh, and we want a firewall. Boom, boom, boom. It's all done just like that. So that's the super fast description of what NSX is doing for us. It's all on the hypervisor and you know, additional virtual machines as needed. And with that, I will hand over to Bell, who's going to get into integrated containers. Thank you. Is this working? My clicker's not working. Yes, it is. OK, so uh, what I'm going to talk about is VMware integrated containers. So this is our container strategy working specifically on vSphere. I'm not going to and NSXV. I'm not going to talk about PKS. I'm not going to talk about NSXT. We can wax lyrical about that in the pub tonight. Um, so I think the, the, the key thing from what Hans was just talking about was from a networking person's perspective, what NSXV provides to most businesses is agility. I'm a networking guy, right? Like I spent the last 10 years as an architect with big integrators, working with um, health companies and universities. And the problem with networking in general, most networking people, we're pretty, we're not agile. We're pretty, you know, stuck in our ways. Because if networking guys break something, we generally break something for everyone and we break everything. So we have a specific way of working. The benefit of V, NSXV, is it provides agility, allows us to do stuff in software, it gives us a lot of flexibility. So networking guys start to, to like it from that perspective. So where containers then comes in is containers, my understanding, and like I say, I'm a networking guy, I'm not an application guy or a developer, but for me, the way I understand containers is containers is a same sort of agile approach, but for the dev guys, for the apps guys, right? Who here knows about containers or what a container is? Does anyone want to give me a, no? You might get a prize. Hans has got his pitching arm or throwing arm, whatever. Anyone? It was an arm up. So with, con <laughs> with containers, so I'll, I'll keep it simple in the way I understand it, right? So containers back in the day, it's similar to VLANs, right? So we had logical area networks, we had LANs, um, and back in the day from a networking perspective, if you wanted a build additional segments, you'd put in additional physical switches and additional cabling, right? And then we created virtual LANs and we could do stuff logically. Containers is a, a similar concept, but starting to look at CPU memory, um, compute resources, and allowing us to run multiple applications on one VM or physical host or whatever it is, um, but they're effectively isolated. Uh, from each other. So that way, from a management perspective, from an operations perspective, you can interact, you can upgrade, you can downgrade, etc. Uh, you can move the components, you can install, and it's a, it's a self-contained object. It will not impact other containers and won't impact anything else running on the system, right? So similar sort of concept. So this first slide, what I wanted to just do is start talking about things from, we're, we're going to talk about everything from a networking perspective. So for those of you who haven't played with the containers or aren't familiar, there's two key networking constructs you should be aware of or you should understand with, with containers. The first one is the public network and the second one is the bridge network. So we'll talk about this a bit more. So the image I've got there, I've got a Docker host, right? So when we talk about containers, generally we talk about Docker. Docker has the concept of a Docker host, and it's a VM or it's a physical machine on which you can run multiple containers. It has a front-facing Docker API that you can interact with and um, control and manipulate. So when you access these containers, you'll see down the bottom, um, I have the, the public network. The public network is the, the public entryway to access your containers. Right? So if you're uh, another VM, another host or, uh, in the environment, or you're trying to access those containers, you will always come in via the public network. What is the public network? It's literally an Ethernet port, has a public IP, and it perform performs some sort of natting to get to the various containers that are running on the Docker host. So that's when we start talking about the bridge network. The bridge network is the internal network. It's not 
uh, accessible outside of the Docker host. It's the internal network that allows the containers to talk to each other, right? So that network is using a private IP space, right? What happens is as the packets come into the Docker host, you access on the public IP, the public network port, the public interface. Then there's a NAT translation and a port address translation that happens to get that packet to the various containers. So the question you might be asking yourself is, OK, if I've got two containers and they're both running web services, port, uh, HTTP, how do I manage that? How do I access both containers individually? How do I know which one I'm hitting if I'm accessing both containers on the one IP, the one public IP of the Docker host? So that's where the, um, the port address translation comes into play. I don't know if my laser will work. Hopefully you guys can see that. So here, we've got two Docker containers running, both running web services. I've got web, web2. And what I do is I basically map a public, IP, a public port back to the private port. So they're both running web services on port 5000, right? But we hit one on port 8000 and one on 8005, yeah? So that's how the Docker host knows which container you want to go to. You hit the public IP on port 8000, the Docker host goes, OK, you want to be talking to web 1. If you hit it on 8005, we talk to web 2. It gets that. Make sense? OK, poses a challenge. How do we provide network services? How do we provide security? Is this now a bottleneck if everything has to go through here? If I've got 50 of these containers running on my one host, it introduces challenges, right? That's, where, that's what we're trying to address with Vic. So a couple of very smart people within VMware came up with VMware integrated containers. And what we've done is we've now got this lovely new component called the VCH, yeah? Virtual Container Host. This is the equivalent of our Docker host. This is the guy that presents the Docker API endpoints that we can then interact with to create our containers and to control things. So that's the first thing. What is the VCH and what are all of our containers from a, VM, uh, from a VIC perspective? They all appear as just VMs, right? It's running a Photon OS, so it's a very lightweight OS, Linux-based. Um, so from a management and operations perspective, you're now using constructs that, as a vSphere admin, you're completely familiar with, right? So it's now starting to get a bit easy from that perspective. So we have VCH, Docker API endpoint. It's backed by vSphere resource pools. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and we can map our containers and our ports, et cetera, et cetera. OK, so we've dealt with the operations and management side. What we haven't quite dealt with yet is the networking limitations of, of Docker, as, as we see it from an NSX perspective, right? So the other thing they introduced was the container network. Right, so we still have the bridge network, we still have the public network, exactly the same as native traditional Docker. We introduce the container network. When we introduce the container network, we're effectively plugging those containers, which are just VMs, into a distributed port group or a logical switch, right? So you can now access them directly. They're on their own unique IP range. Right, so they, you can now access them directly. And because it's a distributed port group and a logical switch, we can now apply distributed firewalling, we can use routing, we can use other introspection services. Make sense? All right, so let's go in, in a bit more detail. So we still have our public network, happy days. If you want to use that, great. Uh, we still have the concept of the bridge, net, bridge network. So these allow us to use um, the uh, various Docker commands, so we're not uh, moving away from that as a concept. We introduce container networks, and then we can introduce container networks with, with uh, NSX. So the big thing about integrating with NSX is talking about micro-segmentation, as well as using the routing and switching functionality. Um, and then we can introduce dedicated IP pools, so we can access these, remove the bottleneck of that public IP, of the public network, um, and maintain our, our security. OK, so what does this start to look like? So this is now just talking about how we could introduce some form of micro-segmentation into um, a, a traditional Docker deployment without NSX. Right? This just talks about that challenge. So 
I've got my VC, I deploy my VCH, I've got my container endpoint, I deploy um, a container VM. So I run my Docker commands, right? So I get my container deployed. I then deploy my second container. So the first one's on public port 81, which maps to port 80, and the second one is on port 82, again mapping to port 80. Yeah? So I've got my two containers spun up. So I've still got my, uh, my bridge network, I've got my public network, so when I want to access these two containers, I hit it, I hit the VCH on its public IP, and then I also include the relevant port for the service, right? So when I do that, my animation should work. Packet comes in, I get my port translation, that translates it to the bridge IP of the container and translates it to port 80. Packet goes through, happy days, everyone's happy, everything works. Okay, I now want to introduce a policy that says I want to lock down this container so it can't talk to this VM, All right? So, as a high-level construct, I want to create a rule that basically says the source is container one, destination is VM one, I want to drop 3306, MySQL, I think that is, All right? That's the policy I want to introduce. When I actually create that firewall rule, however I do it, right? So if it's VCH, I'll probably be using IP tables because it's Linux based, right? What I actually have to do is create a rule that is the public IP of the VCH to the VM and drop, right? The thing is when I create that sort of rule, I'm, I'm not identifying this container VM. I'm not being unique enough. So inadvertently what I do is I actually drop traffic from this guy as well, right? So that's, the pro that's the problem, right? That's the challenge we're trying to solve. So if we then do the same thing now, but with uh, NSX, we have the same thing, we have the same VCH, we run the same Docker commands, we create the same container VM, but the key thing, the difference is we now have the container network. Because we have the container network, I've got a unique IP for this guy. So when I do create my rule, This just shows the packet coming through. There's no address translation. I can hit the, the container on the, the relevant port. When I create my rule, I can now use the container VM as my source and its IP as the source. I can be very unique, right? Very granular. So I can apply this rule. It gets applied to the VNIC of the VM because it's a VM. The container is just a VM. I can use the distribute firewall rule. What is the distribute firewall? It's just rules applied to the VNIC of the VM. I can drop that traffic and I'm not going to impact any other VMs. Make sense? Sounds good? Silence is golden. All right, so resource pools, why are they important? When you create your VCH, you associate your VCH with a resource pool. You guys all know resource pools, right, in vSphere, right? It allows you to provide some form of control about how much resources can be consumed by VMs that are associated with that pool, right? You can lock things down, right? Why do we want to do that? We don't want a, a situation where a developer spins up thousands of containers and consumes all the resources in your cluster, right? That's why we want to do this. So we have a VCH, we can uh, associate it, or we have to associate it with a, v, uh, with a resource pool. And then against that resource pool, we've associated the amount of CPU and memory that containers associated with that VCH can consume. You can have multiple VCHs, you can have multiple resource pools. So when you start to play with this stuff, you can be quite um, you know, aggressive, granular, whatever word you want to use, you can be, uh, you've, you've, got, um, uh, you've got options. So our VCH is backed by a resource pool. Resources can be dynamically added and removed. We've got enhanced network capability. So we can now start to think about granular microsegmentation. VXLAN for the bridge network. This is an interesting use case. If any of you are working in um, service provider environments, one of the challenges with Docker host, like traditional Docker, is that bridge network still needs some physical constructs. It still needs the VLANs to be set up. It still needs that sort of information, right? Um, once we can start to use NSX, we now have the underlay overlay concept in play, right? So now, 
your physical estate you don't have to touch. If you want to create bridge networks, multiple bridge networks, you're creating them on the overlay. They're logical switches, right? So no changes to your physical estate. So from an operations perspective, that introduces a lot of, a lot of benefits for the environment. No change management, you know, uh, you can be as agile as you need to be. Um, it's, it's quite good. The big thing is, because of all of this, our, you know, we're just consuming vSphere objects, right? We're just using VMs, right? The VCH is a VM running Photon OS. The containers are, again, Photon OS-based VMs, right? Um, we're using the VDS, distributed port groups, logical switches, NSX, um, distributed firewall. We're using constructs that you are all familiar with. So from an operations perspective, for the sysadmin guy who's got to manage all of this, containers don't seem so scary anymore. For the networking guy, it doesn't seem so scary anymore because I get logical switches, I get the distributed firewall. It all makes sense to me, right? The other big thing is we get access to inbuilt vSphere HA capability, vSphere HA, DRS, all of that really, really cool stuff that we get from, uh, from VMware, which we don't get from a native Docker environment. Then you can start thinking about anyone playing with VRA, vRealize Automation, or using it. So VRA has um, VIC capability, so you can start creating your blueprints with containers in there and start supporting that. So very, very, uh, very, very cool stuff. All right. That should say demo. I'm going to do a demo just to, just to show you how easy this is. And for me, when I say easy, that, means, that translates to me as powerful. Because the reality is, you know, as an architect, if I sit there and go in and sit with my um, C-level and director level guys, Half the challenge, business justification, is how easy is it to put in? Is it a massive transformation? You know, uh, what's the operational impact? So what we'll show is how easy this stuff is. So what I've got is an environment where we've set up a, a VCH. It's got a public network, bridge network. I've got a container. I'm going to deploy two containers. I also have a database server that's already deployed in the estate. And what we're going to do is we're going to deploy the containers and then set up the micro-segmentation and just show you how easy it is to lock down the one container talking to that database server versus the other container. Sounds good? All right, cool. First thing, how do you set up the VCH? I did this with Vic 1.2. As of Vic 1.3, which got released a couple of months ago, I think, uh, there's now a lovely UI to do this. But because I'm a networking guy, you know, I love Cisco. I like a bit of command line. It makes me feel... Uh, it, it panders to my ego a bit, so uh, I thought I'd show you this, right? Because this is important, because you can still use the command line. So it looks scary, but it's actually not. Um, depending on where you create your VCH, there's, it's, there's just an executable that you run, right? We've got that executable for Windows, Linux, and I think Mac as well, right? So depending on what your OS of choice is, that you do, you know, what your laptop is, whether it's a Windows or a Mac or Ubuntu or whatever, we've got... We've got uh, an executable for you to use. So what we do is we say, OK, we want to create our VCH. We're going to create it on this vCenter. I've got my user. I've got my password. Um, here I'm mapping my bridge network. So I'm defining what my bridge network is. And you associate it with your port group uh, or your logical switch. So here I've associated it with a logical switch. I then associate the resource pool. So I've got my resource pool up here. Next, I map my public network, then I do my container network, and here's an interesting bit. For my container network, I'm defining what the IP pool I want to use for these, for these interfaces up here. Yeah? You can use DHCP if you want to, right? But in my it's a lab environment, I'm just going to statically assign this stuff. OK. So let's give this a go. Uh, Okay, it started. Okay, so here what I'm going to first do is just verify the environment. So what I'm showing here is I'm just confirming the configuration of the VCH. So I ran that command. I'm just going in just to check that everything's up as I expect it. So first of all, I went in and had a look at the, the VDS to check that that's okay. I then go into the logical switches. 
and I'm confirming that all those bridge networks and container networks, everything is, is done. So you run that command, it takes minutes, if not seconds, to complete. And we've got our VCH up here, and I've got the resource pool. So the resource pool you have to already define, right? But I've got my, v, uh, my VCH, and that's my IP address on my VCH. I then jump in and go, okay, let me just do some basic network connectivity checks. So I'm just doing a few pings just to make sure everything's, everything's sweet. So first of all, I ping my VCH, works well. And then I've got my VM that's acting as my database server. Confirm its IP, do a quick ping, make sure I'm all okay from that perspective, right? So the foundational stuff is in play. It all works really nicely. I've got IP connectivity from my, um, from my, from my, uh, from my laptop, from my controller, uh, control center VM. I'm all good. Okay. Now I'll just go in and check the VCH. So I'll run a couple of Docker commands, and we're using Docker commands, right? So this isn't, we're not using um, um, you know, anything different to what you would do if you're, if you're playing with traditional containers. So first of all, I just connect to my host, my VCH, right? And I'm just gonna have a look to say, okay, I'm definitely using resource pools, it's VM, v, vSphere Integrated Containers version 1.2. Here's my Photon OS. vCenter 6.5, everything looks pretty good. Now I'm gonna start thinking about creating my containers. So first thing, I run my command. So my host, 10, 10, 0, 10, 10, so this is my VCH. I'm now gonna create my container. So the first container is gonna be container one. Can you tell that I recorded this live? I've included all of my errors, bugs, issues, so you can see it firsthand. I haven't edited this. So I create, when I create the container, I say I want the container to be listening on port 80 here, and then I'm looking at what, um, uh, what application functionality I need to push down to the container. So I made a typo, so I'll do it again. And then I sit and wait, and I'm waiting for my container. And I'm waiting for my container. So what I'm expecting here is when I ran this command, I've moved the, the text box, but at the end I included the bash, bash command because I want to go straight into the uh, shell prompt for the container because I want to start Apache. I want to pull down my HTML files onto the container, uh, get everything running. So I'm waiting for bash. I'm sitting there, I'm waiting. At this point, I'm starting to get worried, right? When I was recording this, I was sitting there thinking, oh, shall I do it again or shall I wait? And I thought, no, no, I'll wait. I'll show you guys some of the issues that I was having. Because then when you start playing with this yourself, you'll you know, rem hopefully remember this stuff and, and uh, don't fall into the same traps that I, I did. So I'm still waiting for my bash cell shell. So I can see the container spun up when I ran that command. So it's up here. There's a UUID for the container. I'm sitting there going, okay, I'm waiting for the IP address to come through. So it's alive, but is it really alive? Okay, now I've got the container. Remember when I ran my VCH, I defined that IP subnet. So I defined it as 10.0.20, and it's taken the first IP from the pool. I think my pool was dot .10 to dot .50. So I'm there going, okay, my container's alive. It's got an IP address. Why the hell am I not seeing my bash shell? Eventually I get bored and go, you know what? I'm gonna run, I'm gonna deploy container two in parallel and just sit and wait this, sit and wait. Because I'm starting to think, is it just a timing thing? You know, we, I'm using our internal uh, one cloud solution, you know, um, so our private hosting, I'm worried about, wondering if it's just a resource thing, so I sit and wait. So this is the bit at the end, if you don't include this forward slash bin forward slash bash, you will not get the shell prompt for the container. You then have to um, go in and, and access it. Um, separately. So I'm sitting waiting, I'm, st I'm now starting to get really worried, thinking, oh my god, I'm a VCDX, I'm about to stand in front of these guys and present, and this stuff's not working. So I sit and wait, I sit and wait, give it a few seconds, you'll see me start doing container two in a second. It should be instant, and I'll show you why I'm not seeing it in a second. 
It's a schoolboy error. But. So I go and do uh, container two, and you'll see with container two how quick it is versus what I was seeing with container one. So you're going to do another dust prompt and just, or PowerShell, just run yeah. the container. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah. <laughs> don't ask, don't tell. All right. So same command, I'm connecting to my VCH, port 2376, default port. I'm saying run it immediately. I'm saying container two. Uh, I'm referencing uh, my uh, container network. I say port 80 in a second. Uh, I reference my image that I'm going to pull down uh, onto my, my container. So I want to run the Apache application. And then I put in the forward slash bin forward slash bash. And I hit enter. Container 2 gets created. So I go over here, check container two. Yep, container two is there. Container one, still no bash shell, shell. So I'm starting to get really worried. Bash shell appears. Schoolboy error. You don't see it there. What it was was I, hit, I didn't hit enter. So I typed everything. And I didn't hit enter. I was like. Muppet. Okay, so you get this, right? <laughs> so I go, all right, sweet, I'm happy. All right, run the get commands, pull in my HTML files so I can still continue my demo. We'll eventually get there. It's a lot of typing, right? Pulls it in very quick, happy days, and I start Apache. If you play with this in your home labs, uh, this message here could not uh, reliably determine. It's safe to ignore that. That's like a false positive error. So I do that on container one. I'm going to do the same on container two, and then we'll get into the let's just check. Um, we've got IP reachability to my containers, and we'll load up all of our websites and make sure everything's working. So hopefully you'll see that apart from my little schoolboy error, creating this stuff was actually really quick and easy, right? Creating the VCH, run my command, create my VCH, create my containers. Um, it's, it's not uh, too taxing. So I've got my two containers deployed. Um, I've pushed down or pulled down my Apache, my web files, and I've started my service. OK, so then I go and start just checking that my websites are all running. So this is container 1, 10 2010. It's up, it's running, and I've got an SQL connection to my database server. I do the same for container 2. So that's on dot 11, and I've got connectivity to my SQL server. So we're good at this point. I've got IP reachability. I've got my containers. Containers are talking to my backend database. Uh, we're all good. So at this point, I go, OK, now it's time to start creating my micro-segmentation rules. So what I want to do is create a rule that locks down access to this IP address, right? Uh, I think I do it for container 1. So I jump into the NSX section. I jump onto the firewall. I now make my next little schoolboy error. So first of all, I look at this, and I'm like, why is this grayed out? I'm being a bit. Can you tell I've been in design mode? So I passed my VCDX maybe, what, a month ago, six weeks ago? So I've been out of implementation mode for the past three, four months. I've been in design mode. so. 
I had a bit of a moment where I was sitting there going, why is this grayed out? What's going on? And then I was like, oh, hang on a minute. What I'm trying to do is create a new section. So I'll do it, and I, my brain kicks into gear in a second. I love showing this stuff because VCDX people, they seem to have this, you know, aura or whatever you want to call it. And I want to just show we're all like normal. <laughs> like, we're not any special, you know. So eventually I go, all right, now I'll figure it out. So I go, all right, create my section. Okay. I create a section, and what you'll see is I don't have, what I want to do is create rules that have a source as a VM name and a destination as a VM name. Can I pause this? Let me just try. Okay. Let me just let it run for a second. Oh, have I broken it? Okay, here we go, here we go. I'll let it run for a second. Anyone played with uh, multi-site NSX cross VC? Yeah? Anyone tell me why when I go here, I want to add a rule and I want to use a VM as the source object. Why I can't do that? Hans will throw a chicken at you if you get this right. Anyone? It's too early in the morning. So the thing is, when I created that section, because I clicked the, the plus button on a universal firewall rule section, I've inadvertently created a universal firewall rule section. And universal firewall rules, you can only use IP sets and uh, Mac sets and security groups that consume IP sets and Mac sets as part of the rule. You can't use vCenter object information. It's by design. So I got to this point and I saw that and went, ah, oh, I've made my next little schoolboy error. So at which point I go back. You can see because I've got this lovely globe here, it's a universal firewall section. I go, oh, bugger. I'll delete it, start again. So now I create one. This isn't automatically ticked, which was the key point. I create my section, and then I can start creating my rules again. So what I want to do is block uh, communication between the database and container one. So I do that. Now I'm going to set the source to be container one. So now, because I'm not using universal firewall rules, I have the option to create my or to select my VM. So I go in, get my VM, container one. He's now my source. Now, what happens in the back end is what NSX Manager does is NSX Manager has the responsibility to do. It's got a, a firewall realization engine, right? Ultimately, we still translate everything back to an IP address. So NSX manager will commute, talk to vCenter to basically go, can you tell me what the IP address of this guy is? The container one is plugged into that container network, right? And it's got an IP 10.0.20.10. So ultimately, when you look at the vNIC, I don't show this, but if you did, if you looked at the firewall rules on the vNIC, you'll see a rule that basically said sources 10.0.20.10 talking to the VicDB server, which I think was 172.16.30.20, something like that, um, and, and deny the traffic. So I've created my rule. I've published it. So what I'm going to do now is just confirm that everything runs. So just to make sure everyone's happy, I go create, I go access the, the, the two servers from, uh, two web servers from uh, new tabs. So the first one was 20.11, 20 and that worked. And this is now 20.10. I get the spinning icon. It's not working. It's doing what I expected it to do, right? So hopefully you can just see it's really easy now. I can create the micro-segmentation rules. I can put in granular firewall rules to um, stop stuff going to my containers. Now, the rule I set up, right, was container one to the database server, right? Here, I'm just demonstrating for my control center VM, so another VM, 
because I've got that, con con that controlled access, I can still get to container one because my source now is a different uh, VM, right? I can still, eventually I do it, I think I can ping my, my database server. So what I'm, what I'm demonstrating is I've got granular control, I've got granular access, I've got granular security, and it works really, really nicely. I'm using vCenter object information, right? I'm using vSphere constructs, so from a support perspective, from a management perspective, administration, it's all stuff I know and love, it's all stuff I understand. Sounds good? All right. So that's me pretty much done. So what we've shown you today is a quick review of NSX. Gone through Vic. So a bit of an overview of Vic, why it's important. I still think, so Vic has a place versus, so if you're talking to customers or partners and you're talking about is it VMware integrated containers or is it NSXT plus Kubernetes, the PKS kind of setup, PKS works, will work for the larger customers if they're doing a lot of containers. But if you're talking to a customer that is saying, I'm just starting to play, um, you know, I'm doing a little bit of containers, but I haven't quite figured out my strategy. If they've got vSphere and Enterprise Plus licenses, Vic is pretty much free. Right? We don't charge for it. So you can go download the uh, appliances, you can deploy it into the environment, um, and they can play with containers, but consume containers using vSphere constructs that they know and love and understand. So then it becomes the, the barrier to, you know, the entry barriers disappear. You know, the understanding of Docker, you know, how do I manage containers, all of that administration and operations piece just goes out the window. That's why I really like, like Vic. Vic's good in a production environment for the smaller deployments. You know, we, we sometimes say 100 or less or 200 containers in the environment. But really, once you start talking to, if, you, if you're talking to the Netflixes of the world, that's where you need the orchestration capabilities that come with Kubernetes. Vic doesn't have orchestration capabilities natively. We achieve that using by integrating with VRA. Right? But VRA is more of an automation tool versus an orchestration tool and a lifecycle management tool, which is what you get from Kubernetes. So some of the some of the fun here, thinking my way and listening to you, because um, I'm always learning from Bell, I'm always learning from everybody on our live fire team, because everybody has uh, a specific expertise. But then, like I said, we have to teach a solution of these things being integrated together. So I'm sitting over here connecting the dots again in my head, thinking, okay, you've got vSphere, you've got vSphere networking, you're going to use vSphere networking with NSX. Now I have NSX to create that layer two VXLAN, multiple VXLANs, and I also have micro-segmentation. I have that distributed virtual firewall. I could use that with traditional virtual machines. There's integration one, vSphere and NSX, traditional virtual machines. Got that. Well, enter, uh, well, before we even get to VMware integrated containers, we have Docker as a, as a you know, tool that's out there to create this thing called containers, which is actually what, application virtualization fundamentally inside of a computer, where we say, well, why don't we use virtual machines as the container holder? So it's like a container for a container. And because of that, you get all the benefits of vSphere. You get the DR or DRS, you get the high availability, you get the NSX networking. And because of that, each virtual machine can hold a single container, and therefore now we can attach the NSX networks to the virtual machines and call that the container network, correct? And use the NSX tools, such as micro-segmentation, to achieve the result of being able to micro-segment those containers, um, basically by doing it to the virtual machines. And so there's your other integration point. So for those of you who are like, I got vSphere, I got NSX, I'm over here with containers, now you see how it all works together um, by what Val showed you there. And uh, one more thing we'll integrate with y'all later is, of course, beer and rubber chickens <laughs> um, at Gritty's. Um, speaking of which, uh, I will throw one out now. We're trying to tease you guys with a question, but tonight you will all be getting your virtual chickens at Gritty's. <laughs> And uh, for those of you who know me, there's a whole long story about that. I'll tell you that this evening. Um, do you want to open up for questions? You got a couple, a couple more minutes. Yeah, can do. Absolutely. Okay. Questions. Wayne. 
Hey, um, I understand the NSX concepts. I, I, you know, it, it's familiar to me. Uh, container isolation on VMware is not as familiar to me. So you have ECH, okay? Now, it looks like that's going to be your container elastic thing, but you're talking about spinning up a virtual machine for a container. And that's contrary to the concept of containerization, where you don't have virtual machines that you have to be managing. So can you clarify that for me? Because it seems either counterintuitive or uh, circa 2012 technology. I'm confused. Yeah, so uh, I'll try to answer it, um, but I'm a networking guy, right? So uh, I, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll give you my perspective. So the VCH is the Docker API endpoint. So for us to, for us to run Docker, all the Docker commands, you need something to run them against. So our VCH is analogous to the Docker host, same thing, right? Um, the reason we use uh, the VM, uh, we create VMs as contain or the containers of VMs and vice versa, is around the administration and management perspective. So by having each container as a VM, uh, it allows us to attach the VMs to the container network to allow us to use that construct and achieve that goal. Um, the container VMs are Photon OS based lightweight VMs. So very, very small CPU memory footprint. Um, they uh, use, um, from a storage perspective, uh, I believe they use, what's the word? VSAN? No, no, no. Um, storage that appears and it, like they create um, the storage objects on your data store, but they're alive for the life of the container. So the minute you destroy your container or whatever, all the storage disappears and, and so on. So yeah, it, it kind of seems counterintuitive, counterproductive, but um, the point is it's a lightweight VM. By doing that, it allows us to create and consume the other constructs. So you still get the speed of hypervisor. Um, what I'm hearing is you still get the speed of hypervisor at the virtual machine level combined with the container. So yes, there's a little bit of overhead there, but the, you also, that overhead is giving you the benefits of being able to use the basic vSphere constructs from yeah. a management standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. So, so is, this, is this sort of like, a, you got Kubernetes, you've got uh, Docker Swarm, is this sort of like analogous to those two? Or? So the key thing with Kubernetes and Docker Swarm is their orchestration engines and lifecycle management for containers. So uh, the way I understand it with, with either those, so say a container, one of the containers dies or um, we need to increase the number of containers for um, elasticity reasons, right? Those tools will automatically do that for you. With Vic, the, we don't have that orchestration capability. We have the automation capability that comes with VRA, um, and I believe on the roadmap is to integrate with Docker Swarm. That's the goal. So we don't really want to create our own orchestration tool for this. Our goal is to integrate with Docker's um, tools as much as possible. Does that answer your question? Cool. Cool. Thank you, guys. Uh, I hope you got a good overview between NSX, uh, virtual integrated, I'm sorry, VMware integrated containers, and then combining the two. Um, again, tonight, Gritties will be there to talk to you all. The, one of the things I love about being there is the, uh, the, the VTUG culture between the lobster, the beer, and I'm trying to convince them to get some whiteboards there so we can whiteboard for each other, but that might not go well with the lobster grease. But anyways, uh, by all means, Network, 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 and we'll, we'll see you the rest of today, and we'll see you this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.